Welcome to the Craftsman Online Podcast, the only five-star rated Masonic podcast endorsed by the Grand Lodge of New York. Any opinions, thoughts, or viewpoints shared during this program are that of the individual and do not reflect the official position of any Grand Lodge, appendant, or concordant body from which that member may hail. I'm your host, Brother Michael Arce, co-founder of CraftsmanOnline.com. We're going to be talking and examining the biblical connections in the EA degree on this episode with Brother Jason Short, who returns to provide some insight into his lecture, which is titled An Exploration of the Words and Widows. Just a quick note, uh, there is the copy of this, which if you go into the show notes, look for the links and you can get your own PDF copy thanks to craftsmanonline.com and our brother Jason Short as he examines the deeper parts of the biblical connections in the first degree of masonry. And specifically, we'll be getting into the keystones that provide more of a rite of passage, which is his terminology. So before we get started, let's bring him back in. Hi, brother Jason Short. Hi, brother Michael Arce. It's always a pleasure <laughs> to be here. You're almost like a, what, I think a four-time defending champion now, if we had the lightning round. <laughs> but uh, one of my favorite guests to have come back in and, and cont- continues to amaze me with the special things, the work that you're doing in just seeking that light that we're all promised in Freemasonry. And then the cool part is sharing it. So when I opened up your 20 page Masonic research paper, I sat there and thought, my gosh, my brother is like if they could ob- obtain a, a master's degree or a PhD level, a doctorate level degree, that would be it. What was your inspiration to write this thing? When I was initiated uh, into the craft, I was given a couple of um, assignments. So we we we, kind of, we covered the point within the circle, which was one paper, and the, the other was my thoughts on the Endurance Apprentice degree. And initially, I kind of got into that, um, but that turned out to be a really deep Masonic rabbit hole, very deep, and. Somewhere along the way, I I started to realize that doing the extracurricular work and digging just a little bit deeper is actually a really engaging and fun part of masonry that I think is really taken for granted. Mm. So I put this lecture together specifically on the first degree to inspire brethren who are coming through the door to explore, you know, and to discover Absolutely. Yeah. I'm with you. I think what happens is the experience from the first degree, and that's the initiation into Freemasonry, is just so eye-opening. And I believe it's one of the secrets that we don't talk about when it comes to being a Freemason, that the experience you walk away with is, wow, that was probably one of the top five most interesting experiences that just happened in my life. And you quickly want to get ready for the second degree. So not to say that, you know, Masonic education, there's gaps or anything, but your focus is like, okay, I want to go back and get the the next degree after this. And I'm really pursuing that master Mason's degree. And if you've listened to our podcast, we spend an, a great amount of time talking about the third degree and the Hermic legend and some of the deeper mysteries there. But I like that you really went back to this first degree and said, hey, I've got a bunch of thoughts on this. And the first term in your paper that caught my eye, um, you call them Masonic breadcrumbs. What are these keystones? Right, right. The uh, so the Masonic bread breadcrumbs, which we're alluding to here, um, I speculate were encoded into our rituals, crafting them not as merely rites of passages, but treasure maps, which lead us to discover specific ancient mysteries and gems of wisdom, which you needed a key to decipher. Hmm. You know. These are like lessons that unlock not only a better understanding of what it means to be a man and a mason, but also like knowledge that's needed in order to advance to the preceding degrees. Um, And I've been calling these uh, breadcrumbs uh, Masonic keystones, keystones in like the operative craft, um, the stone which holds, you know, at at the apex of an archway holds it together. Uh, these Masonic keystones are things that bridge the gap uh, to our comprehension. They bridge the gap between the esoteric and the exoteric to our our modern understanding to the ancient uh, wisdom of of our ancestors. Mm. It's interesting because 
moving into the next or another body of Freemasonry, the keystone is very prominent in chapter in the Royal Arch. So that mm-hmm. caught my attention. But the way that you've described it, very eloquent, and I think also applies to what the York Rite intents and purposes are as well. So for our listener, whether you have chapter experience or not, when we talk about keystones, these are the ideas that Brother Short has identified, and you've specifically narrowed down on seven of them, which are metal, naked nor clothed, barefoot nor shod, left, hoodwinked, cable toe, and three distinct knocks. For some weird reason, I feel like a host of Jeopardy when I read those, as those might be the categories <laughs> for the game that we're going to play. <laughs> but yeah. those are the seven keystones if you're playing along at home. And I found this interesting because that's a very distinct set of keywords that do appear several times throughout the ritual. So I, I guess my first question here is, how did these seven words appeal to you? How did you select them as you were searching the volume of sacred law? It made sense to me to focus on a section of the ritual that every initiated brother is going to experience. Um, you know, how a candidate is prepared across jurisdictions Um is perfect not only because we can all really relate to that but it also it presented a pattern and uh for any brethren who want to explore the ritual deeper the same way that i've been jumping through it um patterns are sort of the key to deciphering the ritual and looking within the pages of the great light um so in some shape or form these seven keywords or this presentation of how a candidate is prepared in all three decrees we encounter so it Mm. seemed it seemed like for the purpose of this lecture which i think on the night took up over an hour narrowing it really down to these seven seemed to be the most comprehensive i think the other thing that i found really cool about these seven keystones is these are what we encounter before we enter the room and in, in in digging into them you actually uncover pretty much an entire foundation of what our craft is built on mm-hmm. and you can find not only the passwords and a word um lessons which lead to the preceding degrees all before a candidate even enters the room which is really cool Now, I know that your other profession is not a monk, (laughs) so (laughs) I'm curious what technology or tools or resources, you've already done the work, brothers are going to go be able to read your 20-page research paper, but if they wanted to search these terms in their volume of sacred law or Bible at at their home, please tell me you didn't go page through page with like seven different color highlighters. Oh man, I really wish I did, but... uh... One thing that we have nowadays, and it's sort of a leg up on all of the brethren who came before us, is technology. Um, For me, it was instrumental to be able to use digital copies of the King James Bible, of the New International Version of the Bible, of the Torah, of the Tanakh, um, pretty much any uh, biblical text or volume of sacred law these days you can get as a PDF. I personally downloaded uh, onto Kindle um, and was able to then not only read the Bible, mm. uh, but go through searching for specific keywords, which to me, again, creates this new level of engagement with the material. Not only does it give you this tangible thing that you can teach to a newly entered apprentice to like go home and like explore these texts this way, but it takes you to these really amazing passages. And and the point with all of this isn't just to, to find and extract a single word and where that's from. The point is to get the overall section get the overview of where and why these words are presented what are the what is the teaching that um this alludes to and Mm. what role does that play in your life now before we talk about your findings and trust me listener we are going to get there i'm just curious one more question how how many hours or 
days of research went into this project before you <laughs> sat down and even started writing. <laughs> I'm really happy you asked <laughs> it makes me feel crazy but also kind of justified in, in, in spending the amount of time on it pretty much from the time I was initiated to when I presented this paper I've had a part-time ob ob obsession with with my Masonic rabbit hole I have I have a journal that's uh, at least three quarters of the way full of handwritten notes the paper that I presented was cut down from 30 pages. Um, and at, at some point I just needed to, I just needed to stop because <laughs> I'm getting to a place where I'll have enough material to, to put it into a, a novel or something to present to brothers down the line. Um, but if I were to try to narrow it into hours, there's, there's at least, there's got to be almost two days worth of, mm. of time. Because um, when I go in a rabbit hole, I, I've been going in them pretty hard. <laughs> Not only is the work beautifully explained, but as you'll see, he he sources a lot of this material. So let's start with Boaz. Uh, our listener might be familiar with him as being known as the pillar of strength. There's a reference there. Um, expand a little bit more on the Hebrew meaning of Boaz. I found this really interesting, especially the deeper significance of that reference when it comes to Freemasonry and Masonic ritual. The original Hebrew translation of Boaz does mean um, in him is strength. Uh, and we see as the pillar is positioned uh, as the left pillar or um, in, in the newer translations of the Bible, it's actually the north pillar is Boaz opposite from the south pillar or the right pillar whose name means he will establish and the Hebrew translation of that name he is meant to uh, infer God and when paired together and read uh, symbolically uh, as you would read Hebrew um, it says he will establish strength within and these two pillars, every brother who walks into the temple walks between these two pillars. There is something to be said about the lineage. You know, there's something to be said about um, where we came from and, and, and you know, the uh, nature versus nurture. And I, a part of me really likes to hold on to this idea that it wasn't just by chance or by translation of the Hebrew word. Um, that Solomon had decided to name the pillar Boaz in honoring their grandfather. They also um, saw their grandfather as being a pillar of, of who they were. So we're going to get back to these keystones because we had mentioned one of the terms that you had searched several times throughout the Bible is naked nor clothed, which to those that know, recognize that phrase. Um, it's often attributed to the way that a candidate is prepared for his initiation into masonry. Building on that experience, what additional light can you share? Because this was a new connection to me when it comes to the story of the Garden of Eden. We find in Genesis and the story of Adam and Eve uh, in the Garden of Eden, Adam in, um, in the Hebrew translation means humanity and Eve is life. And the two are naked naturally in the Garden of Eden, which means delight. So we have humanity and life in the Garden of Delight, and all is well and good for them until they eat of the tree of life and knowledge of good and evil, which God had commanded them not to do. And after this, they develop shame and are aware of their nakedness and in an attempt Hemped to hide themselves, they fashion crude garments out of fig leaves, um, and God comes to find them in this state of being neither naked nor clothed. Seeing that humanity and life no longer trust in the divine, the divine definition of right and wrong, they have their own definition of what good and evil is. He makes a decision to cast them out of the Garden of Delight, um, and to suffer um, outside of Eden. We learn in the Lecture of Reasons, part of being 
uh, neither naked nor clothed um, has to do with that God doesn't judge us on our outwardly appearance. It's the internal qualifications, not the external qualifications that recommend a man to masonry. In the exploration of why exactly we chose being neither naked nor clothed, I do think that uh, a big part of it is tying the candidate to the time when Adam is cast out of the garden of, of good and evil, the, the garden of, of delight. Mm. When he's cast out of Eden, um, he now is entering a world where he has to choose where to put his allegiance, what, what pillar of, of you know, strength or wisdom or um, light or dark or how to judge good and evil. That's the same place that every candidate is in when they enter into the room for their first degree. And through the process of our ritual, we strengthen the goodness within, within ourselves. From Adam, we then go to Ruth, and our ritual, honestly, is designed to be baptism by fire hose for candidates. So uh, we, you had mentioned the story of Ruth, and it is a pivotal point in the origin of speculative, speculative Freemasonry. But I'd like for you to kind of focus on the whole significance of bare feet in the Bible, because I found that to be really interesting. There's some talk about how it might relate to... Um, when Exodus and uh, um, Moses being barefoot and on a holy place, but but I actually found my attention was really drawn into the Book of Ruth, and not just bo the Book of Ruth, but then also Deuteronomy. Um, now, in the Wise and Wherefores of the First Degree, our attention um, is specifically directed to the Book of Ruth, which, which is interesting because it's the only passage of scripture which is explicitly named outright yet there are multiple references that draw our attention to scripture um now the significance of being either barefoot nor shod um you know details this custom of changing uh property and redeeming a family after the death of a man has left a widow without a husband or a son and this is a law which is dictated to Moses in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. And now in the context of the book of Ruth, the Moabite widow Ruth and her stepmother, the widow Naomi, seek to redeem the Elamic family name and her property by marrying Ruth to Boaz, uh, who's this kinsman or, or a close relative. But there's a complication to this whole arrangement because there's actually another relative, another kinsman who's closer in relationship to the Elamic family and is the first person in line to be offered the opportunity to redeem Naomi by marrying Ruth and giving her a child um, and um, then watching over the, the land for that child to inherit the name and by doing so redeeming the Elamic family. However, when Boaz goes to present this to this other kinsman, the other kinsman learns that the widow, Ruth, is a Moabite. And Israelites and Moabites have this really, really bad history. Mm. And a lot of Israelites hate Moabites because they believe that they um, are corruptors of men. And for some other reasons, which if you read judges and, and get into numbers and everything there's a there's a bad history between the moabites and the israelites and this kinsman he straight up tells boaz no you can have it he doesn't want to have anything to do with ruth the the widow and in this act of selflessness uh and love really the book of ruth is is, is a love story um, Boaz proclaims that he will marry 
Ruth and redeem Naomi's family's name. Now, in testimony, we talk about how in testimony there's this exchanging of shoes. So the kinsman who is declining to marry Ruth, he, as a testimony, has to take off his shoe and give it to Boaz. So Boaz can use it to show the elders and the people of Israel that that he has passed on the opportunity to do this and that Boaz will now be the one to um, to redeem uh, this favor. In Deuteronomy, it's seen as more of a punishment. The widow is allowed to spit on whoever gives up the right. Hmm. And then the person who gives up their shoe will, will be known as the one who has given up their shoe will be their name. I, I forget the specifics of it, but here we see it in more of, this is like several hundred years later. Mm. Um, we see it as more of just an Israelitish custom that's observed. And so he uses the shoe of the kinsman as a testimony, and he goes on to mar marrying Ruth and bearing a child who is then the father of David, who is then eventually the father of King Solomon. Mm. Um, and if you learn anything in going through the um, the great light, the great light's big on genealogy. And when we get to Matthew in the New Testament, it opens with a whole section of genealogy where we not only explore the genealogy leading up to King David and Solomon again, but 14 generations after King David, we have the birth of Jesus of Nazareth. The book of Ruth and this testament of Boaz marrying the Moabite widow uh, and showing this act of selflessness, ultimately without it, we wouldn't have Freemasonry the way we know it today. We we wouldn't have Christianity the way we know it today. It's such a short phrase. And I, I think this is going to summarize, again, my experience and hopefully not too many other brothers, but from what I suspect, probably many that are listening to the podcast is that because a lot of us at certain points of our lives put the Bible down and or stopped studying sacred text and just went on and did other things in life, when you come back into Freemasonry, I wish they would have said, hey, um, here's some prerequisite reading. If you read this these prequel things here, you're going to better understand the degree. But then again, that would give a lot of uh, the degree and the experience away. So then what happens afterwards is like on the back end, you've now experienced this thing. And then you hear a brother get up and lodge, or sometimes it's on the parking lot or at the bar and lodge or afterwards, just wherever, and or on a podcast like this one. And he starts talking about this and you're like, oh my gosh, this is all kinds of new knowledge. And now there's so much more deeper meaning to that phrase barefoot nor shod when they do say, and this is from the ancient custom, when it's just told and talked to you about the book of Ruth, you're like, oh boy. And even if you read the book of Ruth, which I did afterwards, I was like, this is such a foreign concept that if a widow was presented that the next person in line would, that's so odd in modern times. So on behalf of all of the brothers that did not spend that much time studying, I thank you for sharing this because this really does connect a lot of the loose ends. But the other part for me, I've just always wondered for those that were more enlightened, at least in you know biblical studies, how did that shape your experience in the first degree, knowing these terms and going, wow, like your eyes must have been even bigger than mine. I mean, we talk about the exoteric versus the esoteric. And it really bridges the gap. And, and and you mentioned it's like, I wish somebody just gave me like a, a, a book, gave me the reading material to get into all of this. And you know what's funny is in the first degree, the, the book is literally placed in your hand. Your your attention after obligating as a, as a Mason is, is particularly directed to the great light of masonry, which you should use as the rule and guide for your faith and practice. And what, what I love about that is rule and guide is synonymous with gauge. So our working tool of the 24 inch gauge, which operative masons use to, to uh, measure and lay out their work. So too did the designers of our degree use the great light to design and lay out the lessons of a ritual. Mm. When you think about the Dugard of the first degree, what, what is this inferring to? 
Oh yeah. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> it's not like you're going to take a, a snap as a running back behind the quarterback. Cause I don't want to give too much of what it is, yeah, away. You know, but yeah, it's, there's a deep purpose to what that sign alludes to. Absolutely. And, and, you know, so it's, I find it again, it's like Bible study um, reading used to be just really commonplace. And there's, uh, there's a couple of things uh, that are, part of the ancient mysteries that have been lost, like the ability to speed read, the ability, the ability to use Loki or like um, mnemonic devices and memory devices. You mm. know, the, the, these are, these are parts of our rituals that we are suggesting brethren do, but over time our customs and, and just society itself has moved further and further and further away from these basic fundamental understandings of what to do when a book is put in your hand. Mm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it, it, I did the same thing after the first degree when you're, well, during the first degree, when you're told all the answers you need are, are here in this book, just pick it up. And then when it's actually presented to you, uh, whether it's that night or, or later down the road, um, it, and I've made reference to this before in your Masonic Bible and a lot of editions, there's actually text that is, you know, recommended in the introduction chapter per se, the preface that says, go here, read this, read this, read this, read this, you'll have an understanding. Um, and if there's anything I would say about Freemasonry is that when you understand like what the design concept is of this course, like by the end of this course, you will do this, you will build your spiritual temple. And you'll discover this thing that you're you're seeking, this this greater purpose, whatever that is, because you'll be directed to that path by this book. And we're all going to have our own little individual and unique experiences, but the end result, hopefully, will be the same thing. And I'm sure you might share this opinion that I have as well, is that I really feel for brothers where that search for light ends after they get the third degree and the pat on the back and the welcome to the fraternity because they're missing out on really what the larger purpose of, of this really was. You know, it's, yeah, I agree. I, you know, it's such a shame. Um, I guess, you know, masonry is what you make of it and to each their own, but, but in becoming a master Mason, and if you've done, if you've participated in all of the work up to that point, you can't help but to have a catharsis because all of a sudden the pattern's broken. Mm. All of a sudden there's there's something that that happens in third degree that is counters counters some of the fundamental uh, fundamentals of what you've been using as your ruling guide for getting to this point. If you're taking that route to, right. to take the journey through that eye, there's something that happens in the third degree that doesn't line up with that which is amazing in the first degree when i said i think a lot of guys walk away or you know newly initiated or obligated masons is they walk away with a, okay there was so much of the experience that was odd or awkward or unfamiliar because that's if for some of us this is the first time we experience quote unquote ritual and that is its own unique bucket all into itself and then the second one, which, you know, for me, right close to number one would be, I didn't think I'd be joining an organization that talks so much about the Bible, not as in a faith, but as a built into historical religious context that does lead into how people lived at that time. Those were the big like esoterical takeaways for me. The other part was you know, the explanation of the working tools and, you know, trying to understand the practical examination of that. So, yeah, I think there's a lot in the first degree. When you walk out of there, that fire hose experience, you've said, I'm never going to talk about this with anybody else. I'm not going to give any of the secrets away. I don't even know what I can say and to who I can say it to. There's, I, I have to internalize all of this, but I'm bursting with excitement. So what makes it cool is that we have you know, this forum for brothers to at least hear. And of course, I'll mention it again, your 20 page paper for them to download and really enjoy. If if they haven't been excited with the first few questions here, we've got a couple more before we close out this podcast episode. And you've talked about this, the, the moments in your lecture 
And there were several, like I just just talked about where I had to grab the, the, you know, what handle in my mind, because I was instantly floored with your findings and the cable toe to me is one of the most confusing articles and items in our Masonic ritual. How did you connect this with the roots of ancient craft mystery? It's interesting with the cable toe, it's been throughout the history of our craft, like the most contentious symbol that's included in our ritual. Albert Pike said is nonsense. There's uh, every every treaty or, or monitor you open up and try to get information about if it's if it's even mentioned, it's most people have sort of a different idea of it. Um, one popular idea is that the cable toe is the umbilical cord connecting you to the spiritual and that, mm. you know, when it's severed, then your next, you have this connection to your fellow man who becomes, you know, this new tether to, to the unknown. But the connection to ancient masonry is really simple and beautiful is raising stones from a quarry you use a rope in transporting stones from the quarry we use rope mm. in pulling pulling ourselves from the quarry of man into the lodge room we're we have our cable toe to pull us as living stones into our our new world my respect for everybody's interpretation of the cable toe is immense um but i really i really prefer to see it in the operative sense that it's connecting us to a very fundamental working tool of the operative craft which is the rope i'm going to leave our listener as you leave the reader with a teaser for your final keystone can you shed a little light on what we could find when seeking the origins of the three distinct knocks in the lecture of reasons it's uh, as opposed to the Book of Ruth, which is a, a section of scripture that is directly named, it is a passage of scripture that's explicitly listed, um, which to me was like, okay, challenge accepted. Where does this appear? It turns out it it comes up twice. We find it in Matthew 7-7, seven, seven, um, which is an excerpt from um, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And we find it again in Luke eleven four, 4, um, which is a section of Jesus' teachings on the power of prayer and the value of inviting God into our lives and, and goes on into to some other parables of such. But I left it as, as a, a cliffhanger. I left it as something to compel brothers to dig into deeper because ultimately, Jesus' Sermon on the Mount contains everything that any person really needs to embrace to live not just a righteous life, but a good life, to be a better man, to be a better person, to be a wonderful neighbor, just to, to be good is everything you need to know is in that section of the great life. This has been the Craftsman Online Podcast. Again, big thanks. We love having them on. Looking forward to having them back. Brother Jason Short, thanks for coming on again this week. It's my pleasure as always. And if you've enjoyed his work, as I do, <laughs> um, we've already discussed. He's going to be coming back for a future episode on the art of ritual. And I'm looking forward to share some of our experiences when it comes to the performance of ritual, the deeper meanings of it, particular parts that drew our attention to it, of course, without giving away any of the secrets attached to it. Wink, wink. If you've enjoyed this episode and you want to hear more, you can tell Siri or Alexa to play the Craftsman Online podcast. We're available on all streaming platforms with new episodes every Monday morning. Until next time, let peace and harmony prevail. Prevail.